So I'm so excited uh, for the opportunity today to interview you, Karen Briggs, uh, who are a legend to me. And also, it's a really special opportunity because we've got Michael Redmond here and to talk about the project that you've done with Michael. So I'm going to do my best to to kind of organically move through this this confluence of stories <laughs> uh, and topics, you know, today. But first of all, just want to acknowledge you, Karen, because you've been literally a hero of mine for so many years. And I'm I feel like kidding. You, <laughs> the feelings are mutual when it comes to that guy. <laughs> You know, but thank you. I mean, uh, a lot of great players out there, and uh, amongst the ones that I've heard, I definitely think of your of your playing is like just something highly admirable. I mean, I've listened to a lot of the tracks, uh, especially I was I have a favorite, the one you did with uh, Hamilton Harden, and I, I thought that that was the baddest violin solo I ever heard in my life. I really did. Oh my gosh! Thank you, thank you. We yeah. we interviewed Hamilton on the podcast as well. He's he's amazing. I, I love him. He really Hamilton. is. He really is. He nah, he's a hero too. He really is. Yeah. <laughs> Make me die. <laughs> and to me, you're one of the the you know the living pioneers of you know violinists who improvise and who cross into all kinds of musical territories, and um. You know, it's yeah, it's just an honor to to be able to connect with you. Um, and if it's okay, I'd love to just you know to start off by by asking you about this recent recording that you did that's really special, and we'll get to talk about more. And to see if we could just like listen to this track that you just played, if you'd be willing to tell us a little bit about the project from your perspective and just kind of talk us into this uh, this song. Yes, absolutely. Well, you know, the really cool thing about this project is uh, the, the key word here is legacy. Uh, um, Michael Redman's father uh, was a very popular arranger, conductor, composer. And the thing is, it was very apparent in the music is the era. And he was ahead of his time in an era where it's like the music to me is reminiscent of that 70s, early 70s, like funk, like Right around 1970, 71, all the black exploitation movies were out, and you know, and the, the bell bottoms and the afro, and you know, all this was going on at that time. I was a little kid, uh, I, I probably about, let's see, I was born in 63. So uh, my eldest sister, who's 14 years older than I, she used to take me around with her, and she was totally caught up. So she went to all the events and Nina Simone and, you know, these in New York, you know, these are, these are the pictures I'm visualizing. So when I heard this music, I knew immediately, I said, this is from that era. And uh, I know that to utilize strings in that way, although strings were utilized a lot more in music at that time, because a lot of that stuff is in my head, the lines that I would hear, I could sing a lot of that stuff when I was little, because it just caught my ear. But, uh, you know, a lot a lot of times you didn't see them featured in this way where strings were so prominent. They were prominent, but this was even more prominence in a way that you don't hear even that often today. So, you know, I was trying to just kind of lend myself to that flavor based on whatever I could recall. You had to go back and look at Superfly or something. <laughs> 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 Put on my bell bottoms and... <laughs> You know, try to get into the the vein and the era that the, that influenced the sound of the arrangements that that he sent to me. So, That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Yeah. So, what's the name of this song we're gonna check out right now? <laughs> Which one? Uh, is yeah, there was Entre Blue, and then there was Blue String. So, Entre Blue. If we can start off with that one. Yeah. Yeah. That let's kick. Good. Let's kick. Let's kick it off. Let's let everybody listen to this featuring Karen Briggs. The music of Edgar Redmond, Entree Blue. Okay, okay. So, um, yeah, I want to get into talking more about the music of Edgar Redmond with his son, Michael Redmond, who is joining us here today. And just before we get into that, um, since you were talking, Karen, about the early 70s and hearing that music as a kid, could you tell us a little bit about what it was like for you uh, to to grow up as a violin player in in that time? What was your training like, and and what was that like for you? I presume that you were trained uh, 
quote unquote classically, but also that you had other influences that if that affected you early on. Yeah, well, you know, sometimes I wish I could say that because uh, so many people expect me to say that. I, I feel like I did something wrong that I didn't really go that route. Um, I started playing violin just like a couple of months before my 12th birthday in the public school system. I had an amazing teacher. Uh, and this was in Virginia. We had left New York by this time. My family had gone back to the south uh, in the Tidewater area of Virginia. So... Uh, this teacher and the way I fell into it. Oh, gosh, I almost hate to tell this story because there's so many people like they know when they're like five years old. I want to do this. I didn't know that. I took orchestra because we had left New York. My eldest sister was still there. They came to recruit us. They came with this string section. They came with this light skinned dude with a big afro and he was singing tunes from the spinners. They were also playing Mozart and Beethoven and a fifth of Beethoven. Uh, Dvorak, they were playing pieces like that. And, uh, but they were playing, you know, the music that was kind of hip hop for us at the time, the R&B at the time. And, you know, when this, this dude with the afro starts singing, all the girls started screaming. I wasn't that type of girl. So I just kind of <laughs> like, it's like, okay, this is really interesting. But the main thing she said, she said, well, we're recruiting. And if you join the orchestra, if you take it up in summer school, you will be automatically placed in the advanced class when regular semester begins. And we're going to New York. I was like, oh, well, so... Okay, this wasn't my favorite thing to take. I came home, I told my mother, I said, we could choose our classes now. She's like, what did you choose? I said, home economics. And she said, choose something else. Whoa. So I said, okay, maybe I could do this this orchestra thing, maybe good enough to make the trip to New York and see my sister. That's how it happened. <laughs> Who knew 47 years later, I'd still be doing this, you know, because I know there's some people like I'm going to be a, a violinist. I'm going to go for it. This was total fate that this happened. I did have a very good aptitude for it. I could remember pitches and things like that. Even before I knew there was a such thing as uh, sight singing, I could always sing in a my youngest child can do that. Her, her sister, who is 14 years older than her, cannot. So I know that gift was there, uh, which helped with playing violin to understand, you know, not that I always play in tune, but at least I understood when I wasn't. Uh, and so, you know, that's how I got into playing violin, literally. But this teacher that I had was very open and she knew that she had to do this to keep these kids interested. She had a full class of all kind of kids from all kinds of backgrounds and neighborhoods, mainly African-American. and. They will all tell you to this day what a huge positive impression this class had on their lives. And she followed me. She was calling me when I left college and moved to California. She's still calling me. I think I was pregnant with my first child when she passed. And I told her that I was going to have a baby. She's like, well, whatever you do, don't you stop playing that violin. You know, that's kind of <laughs> <laughs> that's how she was. Uh, her name was wow. Jarlene Harding. And uh, the last concert she saw me play was a big concert at uh, Carnegie Hall, the, the one they made the mo movie Music of the Heart from. I did the actual concert, and then they came back later and did the movie. And uh, I was glad she saw that. Dave Grusin uh, played piano. Uh, I almost feel like I should say I accompanied him, but <laughs> he accompanied me. It was a lot of fun. Our families met. We had dinner at the Russian Tea Room. It was an amazing event at that time. It was probably in, like, 1999. But uh, yeah, that's how I got into playing violin. And later, I think when I got into college, I saw this class called sight singing and air training. I was like, oh, there is a such thing. Uh, yeah, there's a class for this. They teach me how to do this. Uh, they did it, of course, with solfeggio. Um, I just knew what the notes were. So I made a deal with my, my professor. I was like, so if I come in just on Fridays, you can give me the hardest one. You don't have to give me the first note. And I just sing it. And I just passed this class with a B because <laughs> the class was like eight o'clock in the morning. I had to catch two buses. Yeah. He said, yes, he agreed. And he, I made a B. <laughs> but he just let me sing on la, 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 instead of do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do, uh, which because that kind of slowed me down. But uh, yeah, the pitch was there. And, and so, you know, this helped with a fretless instrument, of course. And uh the rest I kind of learned from experience. I did play in the Virginia Symphony. I had enough natural ability, so that was kind of like paid training. 
Uh, my father took me to jam sessions. My father was a sax player. His father was a trumpet player and also my next door neighbor. And uh, a lot of musical people. My father had 13 brothers and sisters. All of them were kind of musical, but nobody did it, you know, for a job, a living, a profession, but they all dabbled in it. And uh, so I had those influences. Daddy loved jazz. You know, he played a lot of Miles Davis, John Coltrane, you know, all the classic uh, Cannonball Adderley. Uh, it was my older brother and sister that brought artists like my brother introduced me to Jean-Luc Ponty. He brought home uh, the Renaissance. And so I heard that. And he, was, he, he called me Box. That was my nickname. And the very last note of the song, he's like, Box, I bet you can't play that note. So, of course, I spent you know hours trying to find that, that last <laughs> note in the song and make it clean. And eventually, I played the song with Patrice Russian, who was the uh, original oh, person who recorded that, that record with him. We play every time I get with her. I play with this song. I love that song. And uh, you know, I don't play like him, but oh gosh, I I, I love his phrasing. Uh, I had heard of Stuff Smith. Um, I had heard of uh, Ray Nance, who I believe played trumpet with Ellington. Uh, no pointer. I had met him. That thrilled me at the time. He's kind of the first guy I saw. I saw his uh, first album cover, Fantasia. I learned every song on there and wow. I played it in my math class one day. They told us, well, tomorrow we're not going to do math. We're going to have a talent show, whatever your talent is. So I came into violin, played a, a cassette tape at that time, and I played one of the songs from that record. The classic mm -hmm. looked at me like, like they didn't say anything. They just, I didn't know what that meant at the time. But you know, I just I always was outside of the box with it. I was met with a lot of resistance. It was a, an uphill climb. Uh, by the time I got to college, my when I wanted to be in the jazz ensemble, for example, violin wasn't meant to do that. They didn't teach us how to write chord changes. You know, they didn't think we needed to know that. But I always fought for it, and I did. I changed my major because it was part of the curriculum to get in there. But I was surrounded by horn players. And I was like, okay, they were giving me B flat parts that didn't make me feel too good. <laughs> I was carrying a load of like 21 hours and I had to do this too. So, you know, and then after I left there, I went to New York. I was a booking agent for about a year at SOBs. Uh, and then eventually I left there and went to Los Angeles where I also did a whole lot of growing up. I went there in like 1987. And there, the first steady gig I got was uh, playing charanga, uh, you know, mm. the, uh, uh, Afro-Cuban, Latin salsa, and and being able to dance and play at the same time came from playing that genre. And rhythmically, it grew my vocabulary exponentially. So, mm. you know, and also strengthened my because there's a lot of repetition. I mean, you got dancers, you're gonna play one song for about 15, 20 minutes, you know, so. You know, I developed quite a muscle just behind playing those patterns. And, uh, you know, so I guess I'm saying all this to say, sorry, I ate up so much time, but, you know, I've just been all kind, all different places. I, the best school in the world for me musically has been the world. Uh, you know, literally, Yanni was a whole nother thing. He had this Greek thing and odd time signatures. Uh, I'd had some of that with the symphony, but, you know, he brought it in a whole nother way. Uh, just to understand how to groove with that. Uh, you know, and since then, I've been to several countries in the Middle East to play with other musicians from there. And it's like, okay, it's not as difficult to me as it felt in the beginning. But uh, I, when I was in Virginia, I remember somebody's fiddle player didn't show up. They needed a fiddle player. They didn't care. They just needed a fiddle player. I showed up. I didn't know much about country, but I'd heard it before. So I tried to deliver as many double stops as I could. But when I finished, they said, well, you still sound like a jazz player. I was like, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> and they never called me back again. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, you know, and I don't have a large vocabulary in any one style. I probably, jazz is probably the largest one because of the fake book, but, uh, you know, and the standards that are in there, but I don't have a large vocabulary in any one style, but when you put it all together, it, it can go anywhere, you know, mm -hmm. the hip hop thing came and, you know, it was Wu-Tang, I, I played on one of their records. And, wow. Oh boy, it was, the, he just sang it to me, you know, not every violin player is gonna come in there and you're, if I, if I sing this, can you play it? 
I like, yeah, give it a try. He was out of tune, but I, I knew what he meant. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I just played it. And I mean, that thing went like, I don't know, it, it really did well from what I heard. I heard it was like the best, one of the best, or if not the best selling project they did was a double CD set. Wow. And that one song called Reunited didn't have much depth to it musically, but I guess they had never heard violin, but that was the reason I did it, because I knew there wasn't a lot of live players on a lot of music when hip hop really started blowing up, you know? Mm. So I wanted to be one of those people. Um, I know Mike Orbaniak had, had shot for it. He had done it. I had heard mm. some of this stuff. Uh, Sonia Robinson is another person. So I was always listening. I was looking for them because I needed that validation, and I received quite a bit of it uh, over the years from all the different players that I did managed to find material on or find out about prior to the wide world web. Uh, it was a little more difficult, but I did find a few at the time. So. Wow. Yeah. That's a, that's, that's gold right there. Everything yeah. you shared. That's, that's amazing. Oh, <laughs> um, it, how did you get your career going in Los Angeles? You know, I just went out there. I would walk up to bands. I didn't care what the genre was. If I thought I could hang with them, I wanted to. So I would just kind of sit around. I got real cute. <laughs> and, uh, and I would just sit there and then I'd they'd take their breaks. And I'd be like, hi, how are you? Hi, I'm a musician. I was wondering if I could sit in with you. You know, I'd ask over and over and over again. They're like, sure, what do you play? I would say violin. They'd be like, violin. You know, it might be a reggae band or something like that. But I knew I could find a role in the music. Hmm. Uh, usually it would be the guitar part or something in my range that I could do. So, you know, I remember this one guy, I'm, I met him, uh, this bass player named uh, Cornelius Mims. He was playing at a club. Yes, that, that no, no, yes. You know him? Yeah, he was playing at a club downtown L.A. that was owned by Prince. And he had this band. And he's an amazing musician, amazing MD, had this band there. And I went and I asked, you know, actually my friend, my roommate yeah. at the time asked him, can, can she sit in with you? Sure. What does she play? Violin. He's looking at me. He's doing all this classic R&B, James Brown, you know, violin. Like, we don't have any string parts. <laughs> I'm like, no, it's uh, just let her play. And she said, if she if she doesn't rock the house, um, I'll give my daughter to you. That's what this room is. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of pressure, right? And when I got up there, I didn't know what they were going to play, but he called this James Brown tune called uh, Papa Don't Take No Mess. <laughs> and they, they landed on a groove and I took a solo and everybody was shocked. I made it fit. You know, it was it was grooving. It was different, but it I made it fit. I knew some of the horn lines. You know, I grew up on this music, you know, so. You know, it, was, it just hadn't been done on violin. I don't think it was anything genius. It's just it was just on a, a different sound than people were used to hearing. It wasn't a horn. Uh, and boy, after that, uh, violin <laughs> and that guy, we we became very good friends. We played a lot of music together. He's on some of my records. He's got me other gigs with with Mary Mary and other artists in the gospel genre. That was another genre I spent a lot of time with. Also, uh, especially because of my grandfather, he was the pastor of our family church. And I grew up in Virginia, so you know I played a lot of churches, a lot of weddings. I think I, there was a time in my life I I couldn't go anywhere without playing Amazing Grace, my rendition. But the way I heard Amazing Grace was from people like Mahalia Jackson or Aretha Franklin. So my interpretation on the violin was a little different than the standard three four version. It had a lot of melisma, and I thought nothing of it. I didn't. The first time my teacher heard me do it. She said, no, you can't do that. She she mm. almost ended my career for about 10 minutes. Mm. And then she thought about it and she came back. She said, never mind, you just play it like how how however you feel it. Because if she hadn't said that, I probably wouldn't be playing to this day. Mm. I just lived on anything she said to me. If she said it was good, it was good. If she said it was bad, because I was very young, of course, and uh, very impressionable. And I had a great deal of respect for this woman. So, you know, uh, you know, she she came back later and she said, you know, I just interpret it the way you feel it. And and from that point on, I did. But as you probably know, I did run up against quite a bit of uh, resistance about trying to pursue this direction on this instrument. It's just uh, wasn't widely accepted. It's so much better now. It has evolved and it was going to evolve. I don't know why 
so much resistance. It was going to do every instrument evolves through history and violin was going to do it too and be included in some other genres. And now it is. And a lot more people are doing it and into it and open to it. And, you know, hopefully, uh, not that it has to be the standard of what is, but just a standard of acceptance is, is all we're asking for. It would be nice to be able to call an orchestra in Europe to play on your project and not have their nose up in the air about it, uh, you know, and have them take it serious and, and you know, and really play well and, you know, not see it as less than, you know, the, those kind of attitudes, uh, I think, are what we've been up against for a lot of years. But I think what's happening now is amazing. Uh, each new generation is coming up and and doing just that. They all seem to think they're doing it for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, it's cool though. I mean, I'm enjoying, you know, the different players I've been hearing, uh, you know, who, who are doing the music of their time, just like I did. Yeah, that's so beautiful. Well, and I, and I mean, you're a big part of the reason that it has changed and that it is evolving and that the that the younger generations are doing it you know i know because i looked up to you from early on because there was it was hard for me to find anybody and so i mean at least from from what i was aware of you were one of the only the only people that i could find to get that validation as you said um and uh aside from some of the other folks you mentioned but you were really a pioneer you're a truly a legend and a pioneer and just hearing everything that you just said just resonates is so deep like i can, like i just hang on to every word that you just said so if anybody's listening to this i encourage you to rewind and just listen to everything kara just said again uh i would i mean speaking of pioneers and you know i mean i think hopefully it's a good time to segue and talk about this this pioneer that we're here also to celebrate Edgar Redmond, um, which is Michael's, Michael's father. And I understand also that your grandfather, Michael was a pioneer as well. I wonder if you could start by telling us and, and just to clarify for the listeners, again, the piece that we heard earlier and what we'll be hearing uh, some more of, of Karen's marvelous playing is, was composed by, Edgar Redmond, which is Michael Redmond's father. And uh, Michael is um, getting these works performed by his father that his father composed many, many years ago. Um, so could you tell us a little bit about your grandfather and your father and the projects that are that are happening? Because it's it just it's such a great, um, I guess, dovetail from what Karen was talking about as far as being a pioneer. Oh yes. Uh, basically, I didn't. I never really met my grandfather because uh, when when I was young, my dad was in the service. He spent twelve years as composer and arranger for army bands on the East Coast. So I was born in Shirley, Massachusetts. I had another brother that was born in uh, Fort Hamilton, New York which was actually at Fort Hamilton, which was actually in Brooklyn, New York. And then I had an older brother that was uh, born at Fort Dix, New Jersey. So we were up and down the East Coast. And then for a couple of years, my dad uh, went over to Korea. The Korean War was going on at the time. But my grandfather, from what I'm told by family members, was a very accomplished uh, violinist. And... Uh, that's how my dad got started because uh, he basically tried to take, play violin, but he wanted to play the clarinet and the saxophone. So, uh, but my, my grandfather, from what my dad used to tell me, would basically uh, sit down with him on a Sunday night and they'd listen to the New York, New York Philharmonic on a, you know, big radio, big troller radio. And they'd get a, uh, uh, Music piped in, like I said, from New York, uh, New York Philharmonic, Philadelphia Symphony, which was one of the premier symphonies, you know, back in the 30s and 40s. And then also the, like Boston uh, Symphony and I believe the Boston Pops as well. So uh, I believe that my dad always had that string sound 
in his ear because of his dad. And when his dad passed, um, actually he got it in a uh, small inheritance and took the money to cut an album, which was uh, released in 1966. He said he started writing music for the album in 1961, around the same time that he did the orchestral piece. So, uh, you know, and like I say, 50, 60 years ago, that concept of strings playing jazz was very, very novel. I think uh, Max Roach out of New York, mm. his daughter was a string player. And uh, was it the Harlem Quartet? Yeah. I'm not really sure, but she was she was in a in an ensemble quartet. I think it was the Harlem Quartet. Um, and Max had his rhythm section played with his daughter's thing, and they called it the double symphony and stuff. So I think that's the only other concept around that time, back in the 60s and the 70s, that I was aware of that was trying to do anything close or similar to jazz with strings and stuff. So uh, that's basically yeah, and, my story. Well, yeah, and Akua Dixon comes to mind. I don't know if you're familiar with Akua, uh, her work, but... um she comes to mind as 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 one other uh composer from around that time um but but yeah your father's work uh edgar redmond he was a saxophonist and a clarinetist who also was writing music that heavily featured strings jazz music that heavily featured strings in prominent roles as karen uh clarified earlier right you know in soloist roles playing like the lines the horn lines this kind of thing and but he was also a um orchestral composer i guess for lack of a better word a classical composer whatever you want to call it he did it all and and it sounds like what you're saying is that he also had this um deep attachment to his own father who was a violinist and that exactly. influenced him which it really ties what you're doing all the way back to your grandfather, Edgar T. Redmond, who, if it's okay for me to read what you wrote here, sure. was an, ac an accomplished violinist who used to play in community and church orchestras. And I presume this was in the early uh, 1900s. And you said that he used to play in community and church orchestras due to opportunities for blacks in classical music being very limited to non-existent in the early part of the century. Which is, that's deep. That's very deep to me. So you, how, do you know anything about how your grandfather uh, received an education in the violin? Be very truthful with you, I don't. Uh, that information was very scarce. Like I said, we moved uh, from uh, Brooklyn, uh, New York to Los Angeles, California when I was like five years old. So I never really had uh, much interaction with my grandfather. I just, you know, the conversations with my dad, of uh, them sitting around this victrol on Sunday nights listening to the Philadelphia Symphony and the New York Philharmonic and the Boston Symphony and stuff like that. He would pick out things, say, oh, well, this is the tuba and this is, you know, a bassoon, you know. And again, it, it's funny when I look back on it now because when I was young coming up, I mean, Motown was breaking and we wanted to hear all the R&B and shake our butts and you know, all that. So uh, it took me into mm, probably college years for me to really dial into his music. I mean, I always knew that he was a, a excellent musician. And, you know, when I, when I was young, he would go off to sessions and stuff, but I didn't know he was going, you know, writing and conducting and stuff for like Sam Cooke's record label, for example. You know, they had the Womack brothers, which is Bobby Womack and his brothers, and uh, Sam's brother, L.C. Cook. Uh, L. Carter signed to that label. Uh, Billy Preston's first recording was on the label. My dad did the conducting and arranging on his first album. 16 years old, going to Dorsey High School in Los Angeles. Uh, Johnny Taylor ended up sending uh, signing to that label. They had about seven or eight groups, Sims Twins, Johnny Morissette, 
I mean, it was just, you had two people, Renee Hall and my dad, basically doing all the, all the music for a, a record label of like eight or nine artists. And uh, it was just incredible. When I look back on the kind of work he did, I always used to tease him about burning the midnight oil because he'd work during the day, a lot of times doing session work, and then come home at night and he has a little tape recording playing, you know, little bits of the song and then rewinding it and playing it back and forth and doing the notation of the music. And uh, that's how I got exposed to artists like uh, Jimi Hendrix and uh, Little Richard <laughs> and Sly Stone, people like that, my father working on notating music and stuff. Uh, oh, yeah. he did, he, a great artist, right? <laughs> yeah, he did everything from, you know, lead sheets to orchestral scores because when he was in the service, my father uh, basically took courses from uh, Berkeley School of Music, which was originally called the Schillinger House of Music. Then it became Berkeley School of Music. Now it's Berkeley College of Music. And being in the I service. You said Schillinger? Schillinger, uh huh. Wow. Schillinger that was House. the only school in the world that had a jazz violin major. Yeah. When well, I was that, looking at those options. And I should have gone, but you know, I really didn't have the funds to go. And I didn't think I was good enough to get a scholarship. Oh, yeah. Well, Always try, I guess. You know, That's why I love what you're doing with your father's stuff because. Mm -hmm. You know, you always try, and you're doing a great job with it, but I hope my kids do that for me, man. <laughs> I really do. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, I mean, it's it's incredible. I mean, uh, Michael, I've known you for a few years now, and just, you know, from the conversations where you've been reaching out to promote your father's work, and, and it's it's incredible, because you're not in the music industry, as far as I know. Actually, That's not yeah. Yeah, yeah I know. I'm, I'm not a musician, actually. I tried to take piano lessons when I was young, but my father was such a uh, disciplinarian. I had an older brother who took lessons, and when he messed up, he'd crack his knuckles with a ruler or a drumstick. I said, no, no, that's not for me. <laughs> and I heard the same thing that uh, Branford Masala said, the same thing happened to him. That's why he picked up the saxophone. So I was in the sports and uh, athletics when I was coming up, and then, uh, like I said, around in the high school, college days, I started going by my dad's office. He worked at a place called the Script House in Los Angeles. And some of the uh, most prominent producers who were in the music business, uh, James Carmichael's, who produced the Commodores, and Lionel Richie, uh, Gil Askey, who uh, was musical director for uh, uh, Donna Ross and the Supremes both the group and then when Diana Ross went on her own. And it was just a hangout for a lot of the musicians. So I used to go by there coming home from college and stuff and meet the musicians. And it, you know, it's always a, I always had a lot of jokes, cracking jokes and had a lot of fun and a very lively atmosphere. So, um, you know, but no, nah, I'm not a musician. I'm basically uh, dealing with it from an executive production. I consider myself a promoter uh, executive producer and really what I'm really trying to do is be a music publisher take all the music I've gotten all the rights back to it and publish and record everything that he's written well that's I mean that's really one of the things that I would like to see as an outcome of of getting the word out to our listeners which is that you you know there's a lot of orchestra programs uh, school orchestra programs, for example, uh, and also professional orchestras, community orchestras that could be um, finding these works and getting the sheet music. And, and there's two options here. Um, there's the, 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 uh, the jazz inspired works and also this uh, orchestral work. And so we want to make sure that we connect people with how to find the the sheet music so i just want to make sure we we cover that uh, loud and clear how do they how can they reach out to you michael to ask about sheet music how okay. do they do that well i'm in the process of redoing my website but i'm gonna uh have the sheet music scores in the parts on the website and you can go to edredmondmusic.com ed redmond music.com music. okay. -E music.com 
Okay. Mm -hmm. And we're going to link all that at the show notes as well. And if anybody wants to find um, Michael, uh, you can always reach out to me too. And I will put you in touch. I'll give you his phone number. If you're looking for the sheet music for his dad's music, like we will connect you with, uh, (laughs) with Michael Redmond. Um, If I would love to hear some of the orchestral score next, but and before we do, if it's okay with you for me to just read from some of the things that you shared, because I think it's really, um, it's really important. Um, you said that your father became a member of ASCAP in 1961, and uh, he became a music composer, a literary author, a music and literary publisher, and he had uh, actually submitted a piece to the American String Teachers Association Journal in the 70s. Your father's uh, writing was actually published in the American String Teachers Association Journal, which is fascinating to me because he was a saxophonist and a clarinet player, but he was really writing for strings. So he clearly had this vision, this vision of bringing together, um, you know, many genres of music, and uh, he was he he showed that he was a consummate, serious composer and arranger, and he also he loved jazz and he also loved classical. He did it all. Um, his music was an amalgamation or is an amalgamation of jazz and blues with classical instrumentation, and uh, it's 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 very rare, especially in the '60s through the '80s. Uh, when his ensemble was active, which was called the original Modern String Ensemble. Um, And so it's just beautiful to me that you are sharing this work of your father, this legacy of your father and of your grandfather. What do you think, Karen? Anything else you'd like to add about any of that? Well, you know, I think that the main thing here, again, the key word here is just the legacy of it. And there's an education in this legacy that, was missed because I was not aware of of Michael's father during the time when I was hearing a lot of the sound. Um, like I said, I heard strings and music and a lot of pop tunes that, that to this day I probably could sing them if, if I heard them. I probably sing all the string parts. And they weren't easy either. I used to be very intimidated by some of that stuff, especially when I actually started playing violin. Even though I always loved the sound of the instrument, it was like when I started playing, I was like, okay. You know, the the Love Unlimited Orchestra was popular, and that was our hip-hop. So I hadn't heard of his father. I knew there was something going on both in jazz and also in R&B music at the time. Uh, And I heard some reminiscence of that in this music, but it's like the fact that he actually, you know, just recorded it. You know, he he just made the investment and just did it and documented it. And here we are in 2021, and we're during COVID era, and it's like, wow, he wouldn't have dreamed that this would surface now. He wouldn't have dreamed it. I know I wouldn't have if I was his father. I, I would have thought, okay, well, I did everything I could in the music industry. It's done now, and you know, and then his son comes back. I think it's a beautiful story. Again, I, I, I have this envy, not a jealousy, but an envy. I hope, I hope my daughters do at least one of them. <laughs> You know, it's not a promise, it's not a guarantee. I won't be mad at them if they don't. But I still hope that, you know, some of the things that the public will never know about, that never got released. I have so much documentation. I save cassette tapes, VHSs, and, you know, I hope one day one of my daughters has some interest in wanting to do something similar. Because, you know, even though Christian, uh, I humbly accept your acknowledgement of what I've done. You know, this is a whole nother, this is like two generations later, and they're just my mom, you know. And it's like, <laughs> you know, you know, the eldest one, she she hates going to my gigs. The youngest one likes to go. But the eldest one, she always hated it because everybody had asked her, who's still, do you play? And like, neither of them play, you know. The youngest one, she can remember pitches. But it's like just the idea that they would actually feel that what I did was significant enough that they would want to invest in preserving it as Michael has. I think that's just amazing. I, I think uh, it's very honorable. And uh, for the music community, it, it is also appreciated. It will be 
uh, yes. even more so once they hear it, because this was something we wouldn't know about otherwise. When he was doing it, you know, he probably had to break through a whole lot of people to get that music out there in the way that you're doing now. And it's going to stand out for that reason, you know, because it's, you know, there's nothing going on like it now. It's nothing like that. So, and you put contemporary artists on there as well, string sections, string players, and other musicians. So, I think it's a wonderful cause uh, all the way around. It's positive. It's good. Uh, you know, I don't think when people listen or see the live performance of this, they're going to be thinking about Afghanistan, fucking 9-11 or any of that stuff. You know, that, that's what our job is. That's the reason we have chosen to do what we do. Um, and so, you know, overall, I, I just think this is a very honorable effort, and I am very honored to be uh, included in it. Uh, you know, there's a lot of players out there you could have called. You know, he he was throwing, he was name dropping at me too. I'm like, oh. <laughs> 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 mm. <laughs> but, you know, in the long run, I, I did get to participate, even if it's just the two songs. And I, I'm very. Uh, it's going to be more than that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, you know, I, I just, I just want to say it again, like for all the orchestra uh, directors out there listening. Uh, all the teachers, you know, get this music, get the sheet music and perform this music. You know, uh, you know, everybody's talking to talk about they want to, you know, diversify uh, the 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 string world. And so here you go. Go get this music, you know. Yes, this, and this music is legit for that, too. This would be great for a class of young string players to do something contemporary. It's very similar to how, how I learned to play violin. And it held my interest because it was hip. We did a lot of hip music. All of it was hip, regardless of the genre. But it wasn't just all one genre, and that's what made it really hip. And uh, and I think that is the very thing that is keeping string players interested to this day. And this music will be no exception to that. I, mm -hmm. I don't believe it. And it'll be great for, like, the beginners, intermediate, and the advanced players, because you have uh, the level of advancement has to do mainly, I think, with the soloist. That's where you get the biggest you know, variation from, you know, what their level will be. But the string parts themselves, you know, they have a lot of room for expression and lilt and, you know, um, um, embellishment, uh, perhaps, because some of that was going on in this recording in very, very minute ways. But I think that is also a sign of a contemporary string player today. You know, not from 1702, but... <laughs> <laughs> Today is different rules, and that's why I say it's okay. It's really okay. It's just it's still legit, you know. We just we just don't know it yet, but it's it's still legit. It, 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 what I did with Yanni would not have been considered respectable at the time when I was trying to come up and do stuff, and a lot of it was very boxed in. I have to say, but still, in what I did, even the fact that I was dancing when I was playing. Not I ever seen that before, but I never thought anything different about that. You hear good music, you move. And at first they thought they were going to shut me down. They said, no, no, just go ahead and do it. You know, it look good on video. But <laughs> all my facial expressions, you know, all that, they, they like all that. And so when it came out, it made an impression because they hadn't seen it before. And so it'll be the same thing in this case. This will help that transition evolve even easier for a lot of players because they're still going to get the classical foundation. And one day we're going to see this player that's going to be so badass, or if it's not you already, Christian, that just will be able to improvise through anything in any genre and play the shit out some classical music, just like somebody who does nothing but that. There's going to, if not already, I haven't seen that person yet. It could be Christian. because Christian can play. <laughs> but, uh, you know, but, uh, you, you know, I, in my experience in Persian, I haven't seen that one player that just do everything. I can't do everything. I do a little bit of a lot of different things. But there may be that player that's so virtuoso that nobody can question their validity. And I'm, I hope I'm here when that happens. If it, yeah. Or I'd like to meet that person one, one way or the other. I just, you know, ha Hamilton to me is one of those phenomenal guys. He plays a lot of different instruments really, really well. Like, I felt guilty. I'm like, damn, I just play one. <laughs> 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 this guy, you know, he's phenomenal. He and Christian work together, and they're friends. And, uh, you know, both amazing musicians and human beings as well. Uh, we met in person for the first time. That was in Los Angeles for your project, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, 
my kids, especially Kira, the youngest one, she was so excited because I had been playing the music around the house. She knows that music well. Um, and yeah, and the other thing that's cool too, Michael, is that you will be, uh, you know, exposing uh, the youth to, to music. Because I always tell people, you have to play the music for the children. If you don't play the music for the children, how is it going to get to the next generation? Mm-hmm. You know, uh, so... Yeah, I can see a lot of pluses here. That's all I'm saying. It's like my my mind is going, you know, it's like A D D, but I don't have that that I know of. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, there's just a lot to be said here. And I think it's gonna have a wonderful impression, especially on our contemporary violin players, uh, both old and up and coming. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I wonder uh I wonder if, if either of you could talk us into the other piece that that Karen uh performed that are recorded recently if you could talk us into hearing a little bit of that one well uh the title is called blue string and uh i like it because it's got a funky feel to it and uh, karen really stretches out on it you know she has her own signature her own voicing and uh it's just been a pleasure to work with her on these two songs and like i said i i have a whole catalog of songs so we're going to get an ep i'm shooting for an ep and then hopefully an album and uh there's been so many changes in in the music world now the nfts are coming out and all that so i'm exploring that as a possibility of you know releasing some of the music uh via nfts and all that so um but yeah blue string uh, you know i look at entree blue as being like uh a good radio, uh, fit for the radio, but I uh, look at Blue String as being uh, uh, something that when she performs live, you know, people are going to remember that song because <laughs> she stretches out on it. All right, so let's listen to Blue String. Awesome. Well, um, <clears throat> I want to thank you guys both again for coming today. This has actually been one of the most amazing uh, interviews for me uh, just to learn about your history Karen to learn more about you and I'm sorry by the way for making the presumption uh, that you were classically trained and that's that's also amazing to me that you started the violin when you were 12 and because you play your ass off I mean it's like oh thank you thank you well I've enjoyed it I've really enjoyed playing for all kinds of people everywhere I think I'm up to about 46 47 countries now and counting but it's been my pleasure. I, I think I've only gotten paid to travel, never to perform. <laughs> <laughs> what What are the projects that you're that you've got coming up now, or what are the things that you like to point people towards if they want to connect with you, if they want to find you? What's going on with all that? Oh, beautiful! Thank you. Um, well, I have a website. It's called KarenBriggsViolin.com. And I do a lot of like DIY stuff. So I, you know, if it's not perfect, forgive me. But I think it's pretty damn good. Uh, so I built a website. I've produced videos. I have a YouTube channel, Karen Briggs channel. And uh, I started when this uh, COVID thing happened. It's something I always wanted to do, but just never had time. I play a lot of different groups, uh, Dizer, Gielli, Minucci, and special effects here lately. And uh, just never had time, you know, juggling the kids, a single parent thing, and chauffeur, laundry, dishes, you get it, cooking, all that. And, and playing gigs in between, changing time zones. <laughs> It was a lot. So COVID gave me a chance to actually have a lot of introspection and actually time to do things I never had time to do. So I got into this video production and thing uh, where I have some pretty decent skills about editing. And, yeah, I just do it myself. Maybe sometimes my 11 year old will help me. (laughs) And uh, well, I usually do it when they're at school or at work or just out of the house. And I would just get in a zone and just start producing videos. So I have several of them listed. I have an, uh, a concert coming up that I did a while ago that I'm going to release uh, probably on YouTube. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just always working on projects. I have a stack of them that I just need to get around to releasing of uh, songs and music stuff I've published, written, recorded, mastered even. And I just need to assemble it all together and get it out there. Um, yeah, I've been uh, working on some grant stuff, uh, and I'm also working with other artists. Uh, like there's a vocalist uh, named Taylor Harvey. 
uh, that I'm doing a lot of string arranging for uh, these days, like right now. So <laughs> I have to get with her afterwards and send her an invoice for my work. But I love her music. It's very hip. She, I, I met her at a wedding that I played for an attorney uh, during COVID. And she had an interesting voice. And when she sent the material, the material is very hip and very deep and mature. You know, it has a hip hop thing, but it has kind of a, a neo soulish kind of vibe. And no one's ever asked me to work on anything like that before. So I'm very excited about working with Taylor's music. And that's kind of what I'm doing, like, the right now of it. Like, I'm really into her stuff right now. So, I mean, that's she, awesome. Wow. So, you, so you're doing, you're producing strings uh, for, for other people's works. You're yes. making your own videos, performances, yeah. working on other people's projects for, so you're just hustling like crazy. Yeah, like, like I've been doing for the last four and a half decades. That's what this is. This is Respect. a very also, but a fun one. You know, I've, I've met so many people. I've enjoyed it. And, uh, you know, I'm not crazy about the business. I can tell you that the music business is, is the devil sometimes, but, uh, you know, it's the music and the musicians, the camaraderie, uh, I fit right in. I, I just enjoy it. I, I fit right in. I'm most comfortable there. And I really believe this is what I was meant to do, even though I didn't plan on it. Because everybody said, you can't make a living doing this. And I was like, okay, so I'm just going to get married and have kids and cook. And blah, blah, blah. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. And then the marriage failed. And then it was like, you better practice. <laughs> and I did. And I went and sat in with people. And one thing just literally led to another to another when I heard what a tour was and what they were getting paid, I told everybody, I want to do a tour. I didn't care what you had to do. I want, I want to do a tour. Can I do a tour? Where can, is there somebody needs a violin for a tour? I got soul to soul. Can you believe that? Wow. $2,300 a week to go. Bip, 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 bip. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I was like, "Oh, this is cool. Who, what, <laughs> this is very cool." Yeah, I enjoyed that, you know. <laughs> and I and I saw the world. It's the first time I really, really left the country. Like I went to Australia. I was like, "Wow, okay." I went to Japan. I was in Japan for like two weeks. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, it's a great tour, a great experience. And any any everything I had done leading up to that was utilized. All the dancing I learned how to do playing salsa. Hey. It came into play here. That was my education leading up to Soul to Soul. It was great. Uh, everything I've done, it seemed like it was just meant to be. It just kind of lined up without my even planning it. And if there is anybody who's making plans and it's not going your way, please don't get mad at me. <laughs> There's a reason. I don't know why, but there is a reason why things go like they do. And this is the way it worked out for me. I'm very grateful for it. And all the people that I've met and the experiences that I've had for it, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That is so inspiring. It is, it is I could just hear you. Just like every word you speak is just inspiring to me, Karen. That's just. I don't even want to try to re- frame it or say anything about it because I'm just gonna. It's not gonna help. This is like because it's all I'm there. Inspiring every, each other, man. Re- everybody, yeah. Everybody yeah. needs to rewind and just listen to Karen Briggs talk. <laughs> Because <laughs> there's like, that's like a, a, a college education just to just to hear your story and how you did it. I mean, I love the stuff about like uh, you just asking to sit in. Wow, that's so deep. That's yeah. what it is. Yeah, you know, there's some compromises that come with that stuff. You know, there have been some compromises in order for me to fit in some of the bands because you know, I'm most of the time I'm the only girl. And you learn as a tool, you know, there's a certain compromise you have to make on your femininity to make sure they're focusing on your playing and the mm. fact that you are a real musician, not just a chick, you know, mm. looking for a musician. You know, it's kind of an occupational hazard that can happen when you're a girl musician. I, I, guys, it's not that it doesn't happen, but what I found is my reasons for pursuing this and a lot of guys I've worked with, we have two different motives in mind. <laughs> and, uh, you know, no, it, it's just a known fact. It, it cracks me up in things that I've observed about it. But somehow I've just learned, and I went through my ups and downs, but in, I'd say, 95% of the situations, they respected me. They treated me well. And, uh, you know, I didn't have to go through an ism. It was just... Could, can she play? Can she play the music? You know, mm. that sort of thing. And and not, you know, can can I date her so much, you know? And now I'm talking about my younger years. You know? But, uh, you know, it was something I had to work my way through. But 
It seems like I got there. And I think the Yanni thing helped that. And then when I started touring with Stanley, with Stanley Clark and the Virtu Project, that put it over. It was like, okay, cool. She's a musician. We're clear about that. And that's why she's here. And, hmm. you know, it, it, from there, you know, so many more opportunities came. Uh, and Stanley was one of them. They really, the Yanni thing was what exposed me to everybody. It was that whole PBS special. Uh, which was shocking to me. I did not expect that to blow yeah, up. I, I, I didn't even sign up for all of that. I was just trying to make a living touring and playing mu music, you know. But it, it turned out like it good. It did, and I'm grateful for it. And uh, yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't take it back. I met some great people that I'm still friends with now because of that. We we'll always have these stories to share, uh, going all over the world and playing music and all the other things that happen on the road. Just amazing. It was a good quality gig, and. Uh, I'm just grateful that for whatever reason, the seat was open for me, a little girl from Portsmouth, Virginia, <laughs> by way of New York. <laughs> it's beautiful. Um, Michael, is there any, is there anything, uh, any final thing you were you like to have to, to share with people? Well, I'm just trying to get the music out there, trying to get it exposed. Um, like I said, it's been a 60 year work in progress between my dad's efforts and my efforts, I probably have stopped and rested three or four times out of frustration. Didn't feel like it was moving fast enough and everything, but uh, I always got back to it. You know, I had a stepdad who had a saying, rest if you must, but don't quit. And I rested probably three or four times over the last 40 years. But uh, God is good. And has worked it out where I've been able to go in and uh, not only do the ensemble recordings, but I was blessed to be able to do the uh, recording, the orchestral recording with the Budapest Scoring Orchestra, 72 piece orchestra back in February. And uh, I mean, <laughs> it was like a dream come true. I mean, you know, I cried like a baby, just being able to bring that to fruition as I had been seeking for years to try to get somebody to play it. And it was seemed to be unfortunate that I had to go overseas to be able to make that happen. But uh, got it done, got it performed in its entirety because uh, it had been performed three-fourths of the movement. Three of the four movements had been performed by the L.A. Philharmonic with Zubin Mehta back in the 70s. And uh, Zubin was really uh, ahead of his time. Gerald Wilson had music performed by him and Margaret Harris, a bunch of people that weren't known in the classical uh, genre or, or classical realm. He gave exposure to. So I'm very thankful that uh, everything that has happened, good, the bad, the, the disappointments, the rejections, this makes you stronger. And uh, you know, I'm committed to it. I'm, I'm passionate about it. I'm committed to it and just want to share it with the world. That's beautiful, and we're going to listen to the orchestral work on the on our way out, and uh, uh, we're going to make sure we we cue that up. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Karen Briggs and Michael Redmond, for joining me today on the Creative Strengths Podcast. I appreciate you both. My pleasure. It's great. Thank you so much, Chris. It's been a pleasure to me to work with both of you guys. Thank you.